All right, everybody. Hey, welcome to another video. We're going to try something a little bit different uh, with a, a little bit of a presentation here on Canva. Canva. Trying to get a little bit more organized with my thoughts, but you know what? I'll be honest. I'm a little bit better off the cuff, and so trying to formalize these and and trying to do them in a way that it's a little bit more organized and I can share some card like slides and stuff. We'll see how this goes, but uh, but uh, so I'm first of all, I'm glad that you're here. This is an interesting topic to talk about. This has come up a lot um, this uh, this this year for me with my athletes, uh, athletes in our athlete OS program, uh, athletes I work with privately in our blueprint program. But it's this concept of being on the bubble and this concept of being constantly on the bubble. And so what I wanted to talk about today is just this idea of like, you know, why are you on the bubble? How to get off the bubble? Uh, thinking about it strategically, thinking about it from uh, uh, as much 100% responsibility as we can. But uh, I find that a, that a number of my athletes <clears throat> that reach out to me, maybe it's because of where they are in their careers or on the team. They're just, they feel like they're on the bubble and they reach out to someone like me to help them get them over the hump. So what I'm going to tell, help you with today is an idea of just why that is and what could be affecting you and, uh, and, and how to kind of work, work around it. As always, you know, for those of you guys that don't know who I am, I'm Jonathan Edwards. Uh, I'm a U.S. Olympian. Uh, I'm from, originally from Boston. I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I've been up here since about 2001. And, uh, and I, competed in a sport called luge, which is one of the most technical sports. It's kind of under, it's underrated in terms of its technical ability, uh, where you go on down a, basically a sheet of ice on your back feet first. It's kind of like a roller coaster of ice, but I was also, uh, an, a high school American in the sport of field lacrosse. It was a division one recruit, uh, in lacrosse. I played ice hockey, soccer, and, um, and, I also, so I created the Athlete OS where I work with athletes in a variety of sports now, not just the sports I was involved with, but sports like, you know, skiing and hockey and equestrian, figure skating, gymnastics, soccer, you name it. Uh, I've, I've worked with athletes really not just on the mental side of things, but really on the, the whole sports performance side of things, which is pretty cool. Because what I find is a lot of athletes that come to me is that they're missing they're kind of blind to a couple aspects of their sport development and we help them through that and get, get them over the hump and get them to the next level. So, so I appreciate that you're here. Let's get on with the show. I'm gonna do my best here. I got some new stuff going on. All right. So we will start with this. So oh, look at that. I'm already, I'm already not, uh, not hooked up right. Hang on. Let me get this set up. Uh, bear with me here. We'll try this again. Boom. How's that? There you go. Smack my face. Where'd it go? <clears throat> All right. So, um, what to do when you're always on the bubble. And so what I describe as the bubble is this feeling. Okay. It's, it's, it's really a feeling of not being fully immersed into your team, into your program. Okay. And, and this, and I say feeling because some athletes are actually in a position where they're, they, they, they should be a leader on their team. They should be really kind of taking hold of it, but they don't feel like that for whatever reason. Maybe it's the coach. Maybe it's, 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 it's basically a number of things that they can't control, but it's that sensation. But more often than not, what it is, is it's a sense of like, you're, you know, you're on the bench. You're just, you're not quite the starter. Uh, I got a great email this past week from a basketball player uh, in um, New Jersey and she wrote, she's got a copy of my book and she wrote, and she was super excited because the clarity I had given her through the book was that, Hey, listen, your time's going to come a little bit. Don't fear being on this outside right now because it's going to come. But it's this idea of like, okay, I want to contribute. I want to be there, but the coach isn't letting me, or I'm just not getting my chances or when they get their chances, they're not really following through. And that's really, um, it's, it's a tough spot to be in, but there's, it's important, I think, if you understand it, where you are in your development, then these feelings should go away, okay? One of the things that I detest in the world of sports psychology and mental performance and mindset training and all this stuff is this idea that you should just think your way positively through it. And that is, um, 
that's like poking yourself in the eye with a, you know, with a sharp object and going, this shouldn't hurt. This shouldn't hurt. This shouldn't hurt. Right. It's no, it's like, let's, let's, let's stop doing that. Like, let's understand what's going on and then we can work around it. Okay. So the first step here is, you know, if you're an athlete, that's always on the bubble. The first, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a curveball at you to start and talk about this. Are you always playing up? Okay. So a lot of athletes that I work with are talented for their age group. And so, and I also work with a lot of goalies in different sports. And what happens is if you're a decent goalie, for example, uh, is that you always get the chance to play. There's always a team looking for an extra set of hands. And so if you are a, uh, an athlete who falls in that category, you have the chance to play up. And so the idea is like, well, is playing up good for you? And the bottom line is not always and we're going to talk about that. So one of the things that I run into here, okay, the reasons that you could be playing up are this, like you're older and therefore physically advanced for your age group. So uh, for those of you guys that have read Malcolm Gladwell's uh, tipping point, like about the 10,000 hour rule, uh, this, this got popularized, you know, by his book, but the, really there's a guy named Eric Erickson, out of, who's a professor out of Florida who came up with this idea of, of the 10,000 hour rule. And the, the, the research though goes a little bit deeper than just being in your sport and playing for 10,000 hours. They looked at different sports and realized like there's a real, there's a large percentage of athletes who succeed, who are basically born in the first three months of a year. Hockey is notorious for this. Okay. So it's this idea that if you're born in like January, February, March, you are going to have a physical and sometimes a mental and emotional advantage over athletes who were born after say uh, April and then you know athletes who were born in the fall some people give them no chance at all because in a year in six months especially in those during those years of puberty uh, athletes can get bigger faster stronger quickly and they tend to push out the smaller athletes who have not yet had you know mother nature kind of kick them in the butt right so we're going to talk about that for a second. And by the way, if you don't have a copy of my book, I suggest you grab it. It's called An Athlete's Guide to Winning in Sports and Life. And it really lays out just kind of an overarching kind of philosophy on how to look at this, okay? So first thing, you're older and therefore physically advanced for your age group. So this doesn't necessarily mean you're technically very good. You're just big. You know, maybe you're stronger, maybe because of that strength, you're faster. And then you get these chances to play with kids who are like a year older than you, or maybe even two years or beyond, uh, because of your physical uh, ability, you may not play in those situations. You may not get a chance to be, you know, play in those games, but you're called up just in case, or if the team has a blowout, you get a chance to play a little bit, whatever. Right. So the other one here is you play a position in short demand where you live locally and multiple teams need you, like, especially in team sports. The first thing I always come to mind is, is, is goalies. This happens a lot with goalies. Okay. When, you know, if you're a decent goalie, if you're keen and there's teams around you that aren't even that good, and maybe they don't have a goalie, but you're pretty good. They'll give you a chance and opportunity to play. Okay. Um, you have an advanced training age. So what that means is that you've been playing in your sport longer than most of the kids around you. And that, gives you an opportunity to play up with other athletes who are, are who are are in teams that need you okay so then we get into where's my mixer all right cancel that come on audio mixer there we go you should be guys should be hearing me okay i might be a little hot let me just turn my mic down just there is that better hopefully that's better okay you are available to play that's another one. Okay, so you're just available. Sometimes teams just don't have people and you're available to play, so you play up. You have more resources to play. For example, time, energy, and money. All right, money is a big one because I'll just touch on this quickly. A lot of people think like, oh, if they had more money, their athlete would be able to play more. And that's not always the case. It's always not the best choice. Just because you have money doesn't mean that you're doing the best things for your athlete. But it does if you have, you know, if a parent has time to drive you uh, or they just have the energy to drive you and get you to an event, you might have a chance to play up and, uh, and, uh, and get more, get some, just to be more around the game, okay? But there's a ton of reasons for this, all right? And, and so I don't want to get too deep on that. So why playing up 
in these situations can be bad for you. Okay. All right. Now, this is where when you, t- when, when athletes are on the bubble a lot, they're in these situations, even when they go back to a team, let's say they get a chance to play up, but they go back to their team, but they're not really super impactful, you know, for some reason. Well, there's a couple things that go on here when you pull, when you get all these chances to play up. One is you have a higher potential for getting injured. And uh, because you're playing with older athletes, these athletes are bigger, faster, stronger, and they can physically beat you down. Okay. And that physical beating down can affect you mentally. And I'm going to get to that in a second. Okay. Now, this is where it starts to kind of come into play. Not every chance to play up is beneficial to you for, for you as an athlete. What ends up happening is that you have too much volume and too much training between training and competition that this then causes you when you get a chance to actually play, uh, you're, you are, you're just not as, as good as you could be. Okay. You're not as great as you could be. And this can keep you then in that bubble mode, as opposed to really, when you get it, finally a chance to play, you know, in and around your age group to be really impactful and then making, really making things happen. I, I'm thinking right now of an athlete I worked with a number of years ago, and this athlete was uh, on the bubble on their high school team, and but because they were trying so hard to kind of make the next step, this athlete was investing in a lot of extra work. So they were doing strength and conditioning, I think two or three times a week. They were working with a private coach, a technical coach, two or three times a week to work on shooting. Um, and then in addition to the demands of school, when I laid out for them just the amount of hours that they sp- they, they were spending uh, training and competing, between training and competition, it was obvious to me that this athlete was overworked. And I always say this, some of the best advice I give my athletes is to do less, right? And this can oftentimes take an athlete who is really trying hard. Like, you know, in sports, we we sensationalize this attitude of like, oh, the grind and, oh, you know, the guy's putting the work today, right? No, it's, we can't all be like Ray Lewis, right? We can't all be like Jerry Rice. We can't all be, and I know some of those, you know, those names won't reflect to a lot of people, but, but you look at whatever your sport is and think of the the athletes you see and they're, they're on, you know, they're on TikTok or Instagram and they're posting themselves like training, we visualize, like we see that, right? You can pull up your phone and look at like a, a quick TikTok video of some athlete who you admire and they're doing hill sprints. And you then think, oh, I got to go out and do hill sprints. For them, you don't know what their day was like. You don't know what their week was like. You don't know what's going on in their life outside of sport. What ends up happening is that when we see that and then we th- we think as we're scrolling away going like, oh, I'm so damn lazy. I should go out and do hill sprints, but your life may be completely different. And for a lot of my athletes, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll put in their big rocks and their big rocks will be their, their practices with their team and their games with their team or their, or their program. And then they'll throw in like say schoolwork and then they'll throw in extra training and then they'll throw in, um, you know, who knows what, but what they won't throw in there or on their calendar, there'll be things like exams for school or uh, dentist appointments or, uh, you know, family troubles, you know, like mom and dad are getting divorced or grandpa just died or, you know, my aunt's got cancer, you know, all those things, they may fill up spots in your calendar, but they all have a load to them. They all have a load, like a, like an energetic load to them. And so if you look at your calendar and you should, every athlete should have like basically their week planned out, go like, okay, this is what I'm doing this week. And I had an athlete a couple of years ago, a collegiate, a division one athlete who they had basically a, a dovetailing of kind of exams or diplomas or, uh, or, or, or papers and things like that combined with the middle of what was supposed to be their peak training volume. Okay. And when we kind of backtracked a little bit and, and said, like, what were you thinking 
you know, three months ago before this of how this was going to go? And the answer was they weren't really thinking about it at all. They just were thinking like, oh, I've got exams and it's no big deal. But the thing is, is that they, even though you may not think of them consciously as a big deal, subconsciously and energetically, they're taking up a lot of energy. This can suck the life out of your athlete. So you have to look and understand like, okay, there's, there's training, training volume, there's competition volume, but then there's everything else volume. Now, if you combine that and you also look at one of our biggest stre energetic stressor, stressors is the digestion of food. Now, if, if it's one of the things, if, if your diet is off or if you're not, if you've never really paid much attention to your diet or you're thinking like, oh, I'm young, I can eat anything. And so you grab like pizza and you grab like, you know, maybe you, you have like a, a cheap protein powder that you buy at Walmart and you don't realize that that is affecting you negatively. When I look back on my Olympic experience and even though we had dietitians available, even though we had full access to a buffet at the Olympic Training Center all the time, no one came to look at us and say, you know what, you've got a weed allergy or you've got a sugar, uh, you've got insulin sensitivity or any of that. None of that happens. And, but that's where, when you start to look at these things as a, as a whole, you realize that, man, my body is basically taking in all these inputs, mental, emotional, physical inputs, and then it has to somehow process that and then it has to recover. If your recovery is low, well, you're not going to perform at your best and that's going to keep you in those bubble situations. Okay, really important. Okay. Um, some athletes will look at opportunities to, um, they will look at opportunities to play up and in, let's say it's a situation where it's like you get a chance to play up, but you're probably not going to play or the playing volume you get might be really low. Okay, that's fine. But what most families fail to understand is that, okay, let's say the game is going to be an hour, but all right, you've got to leave 30 minutes prior. Coach wants you 45 minutes there before the game. Okay. There's an hour. Then the game itself is an hour. Well, then afterwards you need to wind down. Even if you haven't played the act of like warming up and getting ready to play is such that there is a stressor there. There's a mental load that then you have to wind down from. And many athletes I find struggle with like getting to bed on time. A lot of my pro athletes with, the, if they compete late at night, like let's say game times like eight or nine o'clock and they're not done until like midnight, one, two in the morning, three o'clock rolls around and they're wide eyed, right? They're so they're just, they're just, you know, this is totally messing with your circadian rhythms and your sleep and your body's ability to recover. So that opportunity to play up, it's not just the playing volume itself. It's everything else around it that can really affect you. And you want to understand that that's um, how that's affecting you and where that fits in. Something very simple to do is use a Google calendar and put in these blocks of all your, of, of everything that is affecting you physically, right? All your, you know, your practices, your games, these chances to play up, any additional strength training, uh, physical therapy, massage, things like that. Those are all loads. That's also one, uh, I'll just touch on that real quick, massage. A lot of people think like, hey, massage feels great, that's cool. But when you're going for sports massages, that is also an additional workout that you need to recover from, right? If you've ever gone for a massage and you're sore a day or two or three later, exactly. You've got to keep that in mind, okay? Um, where are we? We are here. All right. Um, when an athlete gets a chance to play up, they can also get to experience where they'll, they'll, they'll play, but they won't play very well. And what ends up happening is that they are then frustrated. They're, you know, up, they have a poor performance and they can lead to frustrate. They can be frustrated and have unrealistic expectations to their own abilities and potential. And so these opportunities can come, but they don't necessarily give us the result that we want. Now, one thing to be really cognizant of is that is that in all long-term athlete development models there's an idea there's a concept that 
and I call this the Goldilocks principle, that athletes should be winning and there, there should be some events that they, they're in where they're winning and some when they're losing and some when they get blown out and some when they win by, by an easy amount, right? So there's a scale here. And what we're allowing an athlete to do is really develop all of their skills under a varying kind of stressful situations. Um, if you're playing in a situation and you are only, um, you're only winning all the time or you're getting your ass kicked, like if you're winning all the time, what ends up happening is like you get this false sense of security and that may feel good. You feel like the results are okay. But again, that training load is such where it's really affecting you, like it's, it's bogging you down. Now, I tell my athletes sometimes you don't know how bad you feel, right? If, if you know that an athlete has stayed up late the night before and you go, hey, how much sleep did you get last night? Oh, I got like four hours, but I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't disagree that they're fine, but fine becomes a baseline. And what happens is a lot of athletes don't realize how good they could actually feel if they were fully rested, if their diet was totally dialed in. And those stressors were in such a way that their body was able to recover in a way that they can then go play and be fantastic. This keeps a lot of athletes kind of on the bubble, right, from breaking into those teams and or those programs that they really want to be around. But when you look at, when you take an inventory of actually their life, you realize it's kind of crappy, okay? So we don't want that. We want to eliminate that, okay? So um, another, like, un unspoken one is when athletes play up or even if they're not even playing up but they're on a they're on a program where they're constantly losing this is a massive mental willpower exercise to overcome and i learned this a lot from the sport of luge because in the sport of luge just to give you some perspective in germany Luge is as popular as baseball is in the United States or hockey is in Canada. Maybe that, maybe that might be a little bit of a stretch, but luge athletes are revered and they're, they're, they're rock stars. So their programs are very deep. In North America, the volume of athletes that compete is quite low. And so what ends up happening is these athletes get to a point and they're rushed onto the World Cup. And so what happens is when you're rushed onto the World Cup, your training volume, the amount of the runs you can actually take is, is cut way down. So you never get the chance to really get the run volume to be world class. And then what happens is then you have to then compete uh, and you have a World Cup on the weekend and then the athletes don't finish very well. And then it's kind of like, eh, why am I doing this? Like I'm constantly like 30th or 20th or, you know, 25th or 15th. Um, it's fun, but you're never world class. And one of the reasons why I believe this happens is because, well, one, the training volume is low, but two, the athletes never get an understanding of how to win. And this is something that coaches will talk about occasionally. They'll talk about finish. They'll talk about this idea of really kind of uh, putting the competitor, you know, in the ground, like, you know, burying them. Um, they'll use terms like that. But really, that is a skill. The skill is, is, is to close out a match, to close out a game, to win. And if your athlete is constantly playing up or has always been in a program that's kind of crappy, uh, they don't ever really learn that feeling of standing on the podium or walking to the bench at the end of the game, knowing that the game is going to be a W in their favor. And this can weigh down a lot of really good kids, kids who are good emotionally, but they're not necessarily great physically yet, but we never get to see them be great physically because the wear and tear on them emotionally has been such that they just like, oh, this just isn't worth it. And who can blame them, right? But the idea here is, is you want to be careful that your athlete gets opportunities to be successful and sometimes playing up like you can play up on a good team and then never see the field okay because you're because you're young and the team is stacked and things like that or you uh, get the chance to um, you play up on a bad team and they're losing anyway so it's kind of like well it was fun to kind of kick the ball around or play but I wasn't super excited about the results 
So the idea here is you you want to get into experiences where the athlete is going to win some. I call this Goldilocks effect. Some they're going to win. Some are going to be just right. The experience is going to be just right. And others, they're going to lose a bit. But they're getting that variety of success to succeed mentally. All right. So it's important to understand that playing back down can be one of the best decisions you can make. And saying no to playing – playing up can be a massive relief to an athlete and parents combined. And I always add in parents because this process is stressful on everybody. Raising an athlete, taking them to events, taking them to games, paying for things, paying for meals out, putting that gas in the car, that is a stressor on parents. And if a parent is stressed financially, then that stress is gets transferred down to the athlete. It just does. I don't care how strong you are inside. I don't, I don't care how much of a brave face parents put on. The idea is that if you are maxed out mentally, emotionally, financially, physically, then this is going to, this is going to weigh, weigh, this will weigh on your athlete. Okay. So sometimes the best thing is to say like, thanks, but no thanks. But really this is where like fear of missing out comes in. And this is where the idea that, oh my God, if I don't take that opportunity from the coach, then the coach is going to somehow hold that against from my kid down the road. That really needs to go away. Because if you understand this process, if you understand what it is your athlete needs in order to develop long term, then you will say yes to some things and you will say no to others. It's just a fact. But if you don't have a plan, what ends up happening is you'll say yes to everything. And that is not a plan. Okay. Uh, I had an athlete years ago. This was actually back in 2020, 2021, right? COVID, COVID had hit. And this athlete was young, uh, grade eight, grade nine, but really super talented. And the family had lots of resources. And so they were flying all over the country to compete. And what ended up happening is this athlete got so burnt out physically, but the, but there were so many resources to be had that everything looked good. There was no plan. So if you have no plan and you have resources, then everything looks good. The problem is, is some people have no plan and they don't even have lots of resources and they still go after all this stuff. And then it's like, wait a second, we're just exhausted. And you're like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> okay. So keep that in mind. So I'm not saying no is the best thing you can, is the best thing you can do. All right. Um, all right. So here, when things aren't working out and your athlete is on the bubble, you, what I hear a lot is parents bitching about, you know, the process, parents bitching about coaches parents bitching about, oh, you sports in general. This is why I can't listen to youth sports newsletters or, that are gear or websites that are geared towards, oh, you know, pa crazy parents or you, pa adults are killing youth sports or it's all too much. Listen, it is what it is. And you're either going to navigate this in a way that makes sense for you and your athlete based on the resources you have or it's not, but it, but the number one thing we tell our athletes is you can't blame things outside of yourself, yet parents will do just that. They will blame everything but themselves. And the hardest thing, the hardest thing for a parent to do is to say, you know what, we just didn't handle this very well, right? And we bought into fear of missing out. And we, you never hear those stories, right? You never hear those stories. What you hear about, oh, I should be on that team, or the coach is a jerk, or it's all politics, or, oh, it's all money, or that other kid's dad owns a construction company, and that's why he's on the team, right? All that stuff. Listen, what wins in sports is results. And what, what to get results, your athlete has to develop physically, mentally, emotionally, and be able to withstand that and deal with what comes your way. I get it. You may be in a situation where your athlete is in a more competitive area than others, right? But I'll tell you this. I always remind my athletes, like, listen, I know athletes that uh, 
that ran across a field and got shot at in order to get across a border to go compete with another country to make their Olympic dream come true. What are you dealing with? All right. The bottom line is everybody's dealing with their own thing. You have to take 100% responsibility for where you at. You are at. So, okay, the coach is a jerk. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to bitch to people that can't make any change? Or are you going to somehow build a relationship with that coach in order to help your athlete succeed and move on, right? And even for the athletes listening, same thing. Oh, my coach hates me. No, they don't. You know, just like your math teacher, you think your math teacher hates you. They don't hate you either. What they're looking for is an effort. What they're looking for is then results. And what they're looking for is is an athlete who comes to them in a way that is productive, not not vigilant, not or not uh, not aggressive, not oh I'm perfect you suck. None of that. You have to take 100% responsibility. Okay. Now, so getting off the bubble, you got to step one. You got to take 100% responsibility. Step two, you have to identify your physical, technical, and tactical deficiencies and improve them. <laughs> and improve them. When you want the environment to change, guess what? It's not going to. It's up to you to come prepared or not go at all. So imagine you're about to hike a mountain and you've scheduled, you know this, this the hike is coming, it's, it's coming up on a certain date and you've got to go. And the day you start your hike, it's cold and wet and rainy, but all you've done is train in the sun. Are you going to be ready or not? The answer is no, you're not going to be ready. Whose fault is that? The weather or yours, right? There are athletes who will show up to that hike and they will bring the proper clothes. They will have the proper footwear. They will have trained in the cold or the wet or the rain or the snow and they will succeed. Will you be then sitting home going, oh, those guys all suck? Or, uh, you know what? I didn't do enough. And that's really hard to say. And I, I meet parents, you know, many years after their 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 son or daughter's athletic experience and they're still bitching about the coach or the track that day or the weather or how their sled wasn't prepared or their skis weren't or what you know who knows what or the refs were bad and they're they're complaining about that 10 15 years later and i'm like you know you still don't get it right so you have to figure out uh what you need to improve physically technically and tactically for more information on that if you go to my website at athletespecific.com or theathleteos.com, go to the freebie section and watch our three key ability, our, um, uh, three key abilities videos. You'll get more of an idea on that, or grab my book as well on Amazon. Okay. Now we've got. You have to look at your biological age. Now, this is something that people don't really think too much about: your biological age, your psychological age, or your training age, and improve what you can. Now. Your biological age, what is that? Well, that's basically when you were born. So if you're born in June, you know, or you're born in January of a specific year, all that may have an effect on your athletes, like your development and, and where you sit amongst your peers, right? You can't really, you can't do anything about that. You can't change your birth date. You can though reclassify depending on what your sport is you and and depending on how you're playing and and how they how they base their um how they base their uh their selections and things like that the other thing is so your psychological age <laughs> i have a new athlete that i'm working with and when i first talked to the parents on the phone they're like listen she's super talented athletically she's always been a you know, above average for height. She's always been super strong, super fast, but she's really young for her age. Now that's what psychological ability is about. Oh, the athlete's 16, but they act like they're 14 or, or the reverse can also be true. You know, when someone says, Oh, he's an old soul or she's an old soul. Well, that also, there's this, there's a scale there. Just being aware of your psychological age compared to your peers can be really powerful. Okay, it can be super powerful. Training age is another one. So training age is how long have you been actually competing in your sport? Some athletes may transfer from one sport to another and they have this foundation of physical ability and then they're going into another sport where they have their, their physical ability is high but their technical ability is low, 
All right, and that's that's something to um, to consider. Okay, so training age, uh, ha- so that athlete may need extra sessions. They may need extra work. Um, those sorts of things. Okay. Um, oops, sorry. Um, head of the game. There we go. Okay. Now, just to kind of recap here. Every experience, winning is not just about the result on the scoreboard. Winning is about the experience as a whole, because you can get a chance every session you go out and you and you play and you compete. You may have not seen the field that day, right? That like that basketball player I was telling you about. Well, she's like the first off the bench, and sometimes she doesn't really get off the bench. But the idea is like even if you're sitting on the bench, is that game you were just there for? Was it a winning experience? Sure, you may have lost on the scoreboard, but for for you as the athlete, did you come out of that experience better for it or worse off? Because there's no neutral. Why is there no neutral? Because everybody around you is competing. The idea here is like, okay, you're either you're either improving, you're moving forward, or you're regressing. So so it's not just about going out and getting a goal or not getting a goal, or having a good result, or not having a, a good result. The idea is like, was the entire experience a, a, a win? Or was it um, was it mediocre or, or, or negative, okay? Are you looking at your three key abilities and making adjustments to your training and competing experience appropriately? So, what does that mean? The Goldilocks theory. Do you... You know, some, some experience are, are going to be too hot, right? You're not good for them. That's okay. As long as you come out of it healthy and not injured. Other experiences are going to be somewhere in the middle. They're, they're going to be not too hot, not too cold. That You're going to be a good fit for them. That's cool too. Others, other experiences are going to be too easy. But even within situations that are too easy, you can still come out of these these situations with a, a better understanding. You might be able to execute a new skill that you weren't able to do before. That's why we want that variety. That's why we want that um, variety in training and that variety in our in our games and in our competitions. You know, there's so much focus now on feelings and, and people getting upset that coaches are scrambling to try to get athletes like evenly matched all the time, and that's not. That's not what competing is about, right? Learn, being competitive, learning how to be competitive is all about managing disappointment, right? So the idea is like, what did you, you know, that situation you were in today, oh, when you were in over your head, what did you learn out of that situation, right? And where can you see positives and glimmers against better competition that you might not have seen before, right? And vice versa, right? Really, really, really important. And then do you understand your three ages, your biological age, your psychological age, and your training age, and where you are in the process, right? Because every situation should be interesting. And what I mean by that is a lot of athletes really beat themselves up. A lot of the goalies I work with, you know, when a a ball or a puck goes by them, they really beat themselves up and say things like, oh, I suck. And I always joke with them. I say, like, listen, if I talk to you like you talk to you, we probably wouldn't be working together, right? And that's usually the case. So the idea here is that if you can come out of every situation and go, well, that was interesting, then what ends up happening is your brain goes, well, what was interesting about it? And then there's this continuous loop of learning that happens. It's this spiral up. Right? Whereas if you say like, oh, I suck, I'm never going to be good at this. Well, your brain's like, okay, and boom, you're done. So learning and always being in that learning mode is really going to help you to kind of get to the next level, no matter what the situation is. And so for my bubble athletes, I, I start with the first thing we always talk about is, listen, you've got to take 100% responsibility for this because that's the only way you're going to get through it. If you're blaming everything, if you're blaming everything other than you, you're not going to learn. You're not going to be able to chance to make make improvements. So what can you do? Like what can you do in all of these areas to get off the bubble and then continue to improve? Because that's all we can ask. Because when improvement stops, when improvement stops, then 
that's where an athlete has a value choice and goes, do I really want to continue with this or, or don't I? The problem is, is that sometimes an athlete is messing up with all these things that they're not seeing an accurate representation of what they could and can't do, they can and can't do. You know, sometimes when my, when my kids, my own kids, when they're, you know, pulling off like an 80 in, you know, in, in a math class, or like, you know, my daughter is a trumpet player, and she doesn't practice nearly enough, but she's pretty good. And I'm like, man, if you just put more practice time in there, you'd be able to, just, to see how good you could actually be. And then you can make a decision. So where do you want to make a decision? Where you're mediocre, or where you've really done things effectively and now you know just how good you can be yeah that's really important so next steps for those of you guys that watch this far please 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 go to amazon and get a copy of my book i wrote it in a way where it's got this massive table of contents so you can choose and pick and and see topics and as a family you can pick a topic and read it together and talk about it and discuss it that's super important the other thing I'd like to encourage you to do is go over to theathleteos.com or athletespecific.com and get any of our freebies, get on our newsletter, and get in line to be in our next cohort of athletes uh, for our program at The Athlete OS. Okay, so I'd really like to work with you in the future. And if, I, if you want to work with me personally, you can always email me or reach out to me via the website or any of the links below. And uh, we can discuss about some sort of custom custom coaching plan because I do run programs my, like my Athlete Breakthrough Blueprint Plan, which is a horrible name, really hard to say, but really good. Uh, and I'll be looking forward to working with you in the future. So if you've watched the way through, do me a huge favor, hit the like button, be sure to subscribe, and then share this with someone that needs to, uh, to hear it. It helps with the algorithm. It helps with all the energy around this. I really hope that you guys will do that. And I will see you... Um, I'll see you in our next video. Cheers.